Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stand as, as God welcomes us into his presence this morning to worship him. Call to worship is from Psalm 95. Let's stand together. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Let's do that very thing by uh, opening our hymnals to hymn 302 and sing, Come Christians Join to Sing, hymn 302. Christians join to sing, Hallelujah. Singing forever, may we come. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you that you have given us this gracious welcome into your presence to worship you in spirit and truth. We thank you that even now we get a taste of glory. Where we join the angels and the saints uh, who have gone before us and worshiping before your throne. We pray that you would bless us by your word and spirit, build us up in our faith, continue to work in us that we might glorify your name. We pray all this in the name of Christ. Amen. Please be seated. I invite you to turn in your hymnal to the back to page 785. Page 785, and there you'll find the responsive reading for Psalm 2, which relates somewhat to the sermon text. Let's teach God's word to one another. I'll read the regular print and let's respond uh, with one voice with the bold. This is God's word. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance 
the ends of the earth your possession. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and you be destroyed in your way, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Let's go before the Lord in a time of prayer as we confess our sins and look to the Lord Jesus for forgiveness. Let's pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, we come to you as humble creatures <clears throat> made in your image and yet distorted because of the fall and yet redeemed by your grace in the Lord Jesus. And yet we still come as those who struggle with sin those who are yet to be completely free of sin, its presence in our lives. We await that day of glory uh, when we will be in your presence, spotless, cleansed, consummately made whole by your grace. But until that day, Lord, we, we struggle and we wrestle against the sin in our lives. We humble ourselves now to confess this sin before you. We, we confess the ways that we've used our tongues to set fire. Uh, around us and our relationships, to tear people down, to uh, speak a, a quick word of, uh, <clears throat> of folly. We confess the ways that we have failed to use our tongues to glorify you, to build one another up, and to speak the truth. Father, we also confess that our minds are often distracted by earthly things. Our minds are too uh, often set on things of this earth our own promotion, our own glory, seeking our, uh, our own uh, comfort in this life, rather than setting our mind on things above where Christ is, rather than setting our mind on the things of your word, rather than setting our mind uh, to work on how to care for one another and encourage one another. Father, we, we confess the ways our hands and our feet have been quick to sin. Confess the ways that our hearts have often been far from you, though we speak words that are uh, pious sounding. Um, our lips and our hearts uh, often do, do not match. And so we confess these things to you because we are confident that you are a God who is quick to show mercy, quick to forgive. And we look to Jesus Christ, our Savior, who has been crucified, risen, ascended, and will come again to put all things right. The one who has welcomed us into his presence this morning, the one whose grace continues to work in us by his spirit, to sanctify us and to conform us more and more unto his image. We thank you for him, for the forgiveness, for the life, both now and in the age to come, that is ours through union with our Savior. And we pray all of these things in his name. Amen. Assurance of pardon this morning comes from 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be confident this morning that if you have confessed your sins before God, if you've looked to Jesus in faith, then you can be confident that he has forgiven your sins, that he has cleansed you of all unrighteousness, that Jesus is yours and you belong to him. Let's praise God for this grace. Let's stand and sing hymn 295. Crown him with many crowns. Let's stand and sing hymn 295. Found him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne, our hallowed and the grounds for music. 
my soul and sing of him who died for me. Every lapse thy matches came through all eternity. Found him the Lord. In his hands and sighed, which was yet Please be seated. We will now worship the Lord through. <clears throat> giving of tithes and offerings, and uh, we will remember also that the Lord Jesus uh, blesses the cheerful giver. Let's stand as we sing the doxology together. Peace, God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here before. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings you pour out upon us as your people. Not only the, the eternal blessings we have in Jesus Christ, but also your gracious provision for our daily bread, meeting all of our needs. We pray, Lord, that as we have now worshipped you through the giving of the things that you have placed us as stewards over, that you would uh, use these resources for the furtherance of your kingdom, for the glory of your name, and for the proclamation of Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended. We ask in his name. Amen. Please be seated. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to our sermon text this morning, Acts chapter 2. Our text will be verses 14 through 36. The last time um, 
Lane and I did a, a pulpit swap. Uh, I preached from Acts 2, the first 13 verses, the event of Pentecost. And so I thought it was fitting. I'm sure you guys all remember that. <laughs> it's been over a year. But um, I thought it was fitting to uh, preach on, on Peter's sermon um, at, uh, after the Pentecost event. <clears throat> Acts 2, 14 through 36. Let's give our full attention to the reading of God's holy, inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who, who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. <clears throat> Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. A man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of your gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, bless your, the reading of your word as we've just heard it. We also pray that you'd bless the preaching of your word. <clears throat> Guard my mouth against error and open our hearts to receive your word, that we might see the glory of Jesus Christ. We might love him and serve him all the more. We pray this in his name. Amen. Suppose that you are watching a football game for the very first time you'd probably be com completely confused. Uh, without knowing any of the rules, it would look like complete chaos. This concept of first downs, field goals, even of penalties, and, and what penalties are challenged, what override certain penalties, it's all very confusing, unless it was explained to you. If someone sat with you through the football game explaining what was happening, it would make a lot more sense, and you'd be able to follow and appreciate the game so much more. Well, last time I was here, we, we discussed uh, verses 1 through 13, which describes all of these 
uh, visible and audible signs that accompany the coming of the Spirit. And the people are divided in reaction to this. There are some that dismiss what was happening, thinking that these people are drunk. Others, however, want an explanation. They ask, what does this mean? And it's as if the Apostle Peter sits down with them to explain. As if he takes them play by play, showing them what is happening. And so Pentecost makes a lot more sense, and we can appreciate it so much more if we listen to Peter's inspired sermon. If I were to uh, summarize Peter's sermon in a single sentence, it would go something like this. God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ, who poured out his spirit to make you part of the age to come. God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ, who poured out his spirit to make you part of the age to come. The, the audible and Visual, uh, vis visible signs at Pentecost pointed back to the Old Testament. They expressed the fulfillment has come in light of God's work through Jesus. And, and Peter's sermon complements those signs by expressing the same thing. He demonstrates from the Old Testament that fulfillment has come in the work of Jesus Christ. And more than that, these speaking of tongues is evidence that Jesus has poured out his spirit. Uh, on September 1st of uh, 2021, Hurricane Ida hit the Delaware Valley. Maybe some of you remember that. I remember it basically didn't stop raining, at least for a full day. It was raining uh, so hard that the, the water just simply didn't have time to run off. There was a flooding in Ringo's. Cars were floated, uh, floating away. And the term poured out that we see in this text is actually connected with a, a storm of that magnitude. It comes like a torrential door, uh, downpour on the parched earth. And that's exactly what we have in this spiritual picture of Pentecost. The Spirit is poured out in power. The Spirit is poured out in abundance upon our parched hearts to bring life, to bring cleansing, to bring the fulfillment of God's promises to his people. Peter quotes from Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. But if you were to look back at Joel 2, you would notice that he makes a significant modification in verse 17 of our text. Joel's original prophecy started with this, and it shall come to pass afterwards. But Peter changes it to, and in the last days it shall be. Now, why would Peter make that kind of a change? Is he seeking to twist the, the scriptures? Well, absolutely not. Peter's inspired by the Holy Spirit to signal to his listeners that the last days have arrived. All that they are seeing, all that they are hearing is evidence that these are the last days. In other words, the age of fulfillment, the last days, this, this age of the Spirit has come with the pouring out of the Spirit. The new age of resurrection life, the age of the new creation people of God, the age of the new Israel, all these things that we see in the Pentecost event, Peter's saying the climax of prophetic revelation has been inaugurated in the coming of the Holy Spirit. And you'll hear pastors, uh, you probably heard your pastor use that term inaugurated to speak of the kingdom of God or to speak of the last days. It simply means that something has begun. It's been introduced, but it is not yet complete. It hasn't reached its final goal. The kingdom of God has begun in the coming of Christ, but it has not reached its final or consummate form. The last days have been inaugurated already, but it is not yet the last day. It's the already and not yet concept that we see here in the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. Notice the already of fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. God promised that he would pour out his spirit on all flesh. All kinds of distinctions, uh, earthly distinctions, have received the spirit. Men and women, young and old, every believer, without uh, the kind of distinctions that our world values, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord has received the pouring out of the Holy Spirit into their hearts. This is 
climactically what the last days has already brought, the fullness of the coming of the Spirit. But the last days is also anticipating the last day. There's a not yet aspect. Notice the ap apocalyptic language of verses 19 and 20. Here's the not yet, the, the judgment that will come on the last day with the return of Christ. Some of these signs were present at Jesus' crucifixion. For example, the, uh, the sun grew dark. See, what happened upon the cross was that Jesus suffered the last day judgment of God for you. If you have trusted in him, the judgment of the last day has already been taken for you. That you no longer need to fear the judgment of the last day because in Christ you've been transferred out of this evil age and you've been made part of the age to come. You've been transfer, uh, transferred out of the age of darkness, out of this age of earthly, death, demonic influence world to the kingdom of the risen and ascended Christ into the age to come, the age of eternal life and eternal light. Think of it like this. The age to come is breaking into this fallen and evil age. How is that age to come breaking into our current age? Through the gospel proclaimed in the church by the power of the Holy Spirit. With the arrival of the last days, there is an urgency to the spread of the gospel. The clock is ticking. Now is the time for the gospel to go out, to go forth to all the nations as the Spirit enables us to do so, as the Spirit brings life to those who believe. And this is what Peter's saying. The speaking in tongues signifies that the Spirit is bringing the gospel to the nations in ways we have never seen before in history. The gospel preached is the means that the Spirit uses to make people part of that glorious age to come, even now, as we become members of God's kingdom, as we become members of the church of Jesus Christ. And you have been given that Spirit. That Spirit wells in you, the Spirit of the ascended Christ, the Spirit of the, the risen Christ, the Spirit of the living Glorified Christ lives in you and in your midst as the people of God. And therefore, as a church, we all contribute to what it means to live in the age to come, to be already members of the eternal kingdom, even as we uh, do not, uh, even as we experience the not yet of consummate kingdom life. And so the outpouring of the Spirit signifies the arrival of the last days. But now Peter turns to speak about Jesus. And he shows here that the resurrection of Jesus proves that he is the Christ. Often uh, at a wedding ceremony, a pastor will quote Jesus from Matthew 19, verse 6, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Well, Peter moves into verse 22 to speaking about Jesus, and that same concept is really an operation. The work of Christ and the work of the Spirit are integrally connected, and what God has joined together, let not man separate. In the last days, the breaking in of the age to come is the age of the Spirit of the risen Christ. Through Jesus' resurrection, the Spirit is raising believers to new life. The Spirit applies the resurrection of Christ to make you alive. According to God's plan, Peter says Jesus was crucified, but he doesn't dwell on the crucifixion. As important as the cross is to the message of the gospel, Peter's emphasis here at this Pentecost sermon is on the resurrection. The cross is emptied of its power if Jesus is still in the tomb. Or as Paul writes, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. The resurrection is central to the climactic salvation hope. Peter quotes from the Old Testament again. He, he demonstrates that Christ has brought this age of fulfillment. He quotes from Psalm 16, a Davidic psalm. 
Verses uh, 27 and 28 of our text highlight the main point of why he's quoting from this psalm. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. In the resurrection, this is what God has done for Christ. He has made known to him the paths of life. Another way to put it is this. In the resurrection, Jesus is the first man to enter into the age of the Spirit, the age to come. The age of glorious, unending, irreversible life. See, this psalm was never actually about David. Or I should say, never ultimately about David. It was about David, but not ultimately about David. Peter is essentially telling them, you can go to a spot, a place, and see David's grave. But David was a prophet. And David foresaw, by the power of the Holy Spirit, David spoke about the resurrection of his greater son. This psalm is about Jesus, the risen Christ. And Peter uses that that term Christ in verse 31 when speaking of Jesus' resurrection. Christ, as you may know, is, is the Greek word for Messiah which means anointed one. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the anointed Davidic king. And that term Christ or Messiah is loaded with all kinds of Old Testament themes of deliverance, of redemption. And so when Peter speaks of Jesus's resurrection, he's drawing attention to the climactic redemptive event. Without the resurrection, there is no forgiveness of sins. Without the resurrection, there's no eternal life. Without the resurrection, there's no age to come. Without the resurrection, Peter's saying Jesus is not the Christ. But how does Peter end his sermon? God has made him the Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the risen redeemer of God's people. But how do you and I today have access to Christ? Do we need to be at the empty tomb? Do we need to uh, be a witness like Peter and the other apostles of his resurrection for that life to have any fruition in your life? Well, certainly you have access to the risen Christ through faith. Call upon his name, you trust in him, and you will be saved. But his resurrection gives you resurrection life by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit of the risen Christ. So that the Spirit applies to you the life and the consummate blessings that Jesus himself has. The Spirit applies salvation with all of its blessings to you through faith. This is why the pouring out of the Spirit is such a crucial and important redemptive event, because it gives the church resurrection life. And so the outpouring of the Spirit signifies the arrival of the last days or the arrival of the age to come. The resurrection of Jesus proves that he is the Christ who gives life to his people by the Spirit. But more than raised, Peter also tells us that Jesus is enthroned. The ascension of Jesus confirms that he is the Lord. Another way to put it is that Jesus is not only Redeemer, but he's also Lord. Um, Many of you remember years ago, there was a debate in many circles of Christianity over an interesting question. Can someone have Jesus as their Savior, but not have him as their Lord? Can someone... Trust in Jesus as their Savior, have the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, but that faith have no practical, ethical effect upon the way that they live. They called such a person a carnal Christian, a a fleshly Christian. Well, this question is actually put to rest quite clearly by Peter's sermon. When I quoted from verse 36, earlier, you may have noticed I intentionally left something out. Look again at verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain 
that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. He's not only the risen Christ, the redeemer of God's people who gives life, he is also the risen, ascended, enthroned, and reigning Lord. Peter emphasizes the lordship of Jesus in verses 33 through 35. He speaks first of the ascension. Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of God the Father, and there he's been enthroned in heaven. All authority in heaven and upon earth has been given to me, Jesus says. He is the king of the kingdom of God, which is already breaking into this age in the church. Again, Peter makes the comparison with David. David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, quoting from Psalm 2, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. This is why Jesus is a greater David. This is why Jesus is David's greater son, because he is exalted to the eternal throne. He is enthroned in heaven as the Davidic Messiah at God's right hand. Jesus has been enthroned as the conqueror. His enemies are his footstool. As he's through his resurrection, he's conquered death. He's defeated sin. He's thrown down the power of the evil one. He is the exalted reigning Lord. And it's from that exalted position. It's from that enthroned position that Jesus pours out his spirit upon you, his church. Look at verse 33. Verse 33 is incredibly important to see this inseparable link between Jesus' work and the coming of the Holy Spirit. Peter says, being therefore exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he that is the risen and ascended and reigning Christ, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Peter uses the same word as Joel 2. Christ has poured out out the spirit he's soaked this parched earth with the living rain from heaven saturating our hearts saturating his church with his spirit as king he rules to defend us he conquers our enemies but also as king he has graciously given you his law that you might live by the law of the king he's established his his eternal kingdom on this earth and in now and not yet manner. It's in the church that the kingdom has been inaugurated through the preaching of the gospel. The church does not belong to this evil, temporary, passing away age. The church belongs to the age to come. We're to live differently. We're to live as strangers and and sojourners, as Peter will write in his epistle. The church belongs to the age to come. And as members of the age to come already, we are to live by the law of the age to come. We're to live by the law of our ascended and reigning king. He's not only given us his law, he's given us his spirit that we might be able to obey the law of our king. I want to for a moment just zoom out. Just zoom out a little from of viewing this Pentecost event to viewing it as a whole, a whole package. You could say viewing all of chapter two together, both the event of Pentecost and Peter's sermon, which interprets it. We've been noticing so many echoes from the Old Testament as God fulfills his redemptive work in Jesus. But think about Pentecost itself. At Pentecost, the people were coming to Jerusalem to celebrate the harvest. But more than that, they were celebrating the giving of the law at Sinai. In Exodus 19 and 20, what do we see? We see that God meets his people at the mountain of God. And Moses ascends into the mountain, ascends into Mount Sinai, disappears from their sight into the cloud to meet with God and have face-to-face fellowship with him. And as Moses descends back to the people, What does Moses bring with him? He brings the law written on tablets of stone. 
what Luke has done here in this book of Acts, in chapter 2, with the event of Pentecost and with Peter's sermon, which interprets it, Luke has given us a description of one better, not only of, than David, but one better than Moses. Christ ascended the mountain of God, disappearing from their sight in the cloud in his ascension into glory. He enters into the presence of God, not on Mount Sinai, but the unending, uninterrupted presence of his Father, where he is now enthroned in glory. And from that position of authority, from the Father's right hand, what does Jesus send to his people? The Spirit. The Spirit in its fullness. Not written on tablets of stone, but the Holy Spirit, which writes God's law on the hearts of God's people. By his resurrection and ascension, God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ in a climactic, redemptive way. By his Spirit, Christ has made you his people. By his spirit, he is your Lord, and he is your Redeemer. You've been delivered from this evil age by his resurrection. You've been made members of the age to come by his spirit. May we as the church live as such. May we live between the first and second coming of Christ. May we live in the now and not yet of his redemption, knowing for certain that Jesus is our Lord, Jesus is our Christ. And may all of your hope and all of your life be found in him. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we pray that your church would know for certain who Jesus is as enthroned, as risen, as ascended, as enthroned in glory, as the one who's given us his spirit is the one who's made us by his spirit, by his grace, members of his eternal kingdom, even now in the church. May we know that we do not belong to this fallen world, but we belong to the, the kingdom of God. We belong to heaven where Christ is. Help us to live in light of that as those who obey his law, the law of our king because you have written it upon our hearts by your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I invite uh, the elders and others who will be serving the Lord's Supper to come forward, let's take a few moments to prepare our hearts as we come to this sacrament. The Lord Jesus instituted this meal, this sacrament, in Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 29. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Here in this meal, we have a visible word proclaimed to us. We have a sign and seal of the gospel of Jesus Christ for our weakness. This meal visibly accompanies the word for our weakness or our hardness of hearing. It proclaims to us. The gospel, that Jesus has shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins, that Jesus' body was broken so that we might be made whole in him. But this meal is, is more than just a remembrance. It's more than just looking back upon Jesus' finished work. This meal is 
partaking of Jesus Christ, not in a carnal or corporal manner, but by faith and by the Spirit. See, this is a meal of the age to come. This is a heavenly feast that is set before us. And we don't uh, see that necessarily by sight alone. We see that by faith. We, we take small uh, sips of wine. We take little bits of bread. And yet, here we see, proclaimed before our eyes and our senses, that we can feast upon Jesus Christ by his Spirit, that in him we have all that we need for life and for godliness. It's my privilege as a minister of, of Christ to uh, welcome all who are right with, with God and his church. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, if you are a member in good standing of a, of a gospel preaching church, then you are, are welcomed to come to the Lord's table with repentance and humility. If you're not a, a believer, if you're not a member in good standing of a church, then we ask you to, to let these elements pass you by. This, of course, this morning is not uh, meant to keep the humble uh, from the table. This is a table for sinners who've been saved by grace, that it might nourish your soul, that it might build you up in the Lord Jesus Christ and strengthen your faith. Let's take a few moments to prepare hearts to come to this supper. <laughs> Father in heaven, we thank you for this meal, which accompanies your word to help us when we are often slow to hear, hard of hearing, slow to remember, that it presents to our senses the gospel proclaimed to us. May we partake it by faith. And by partaking, may we commune with you by your spirit. And may we be pointed to that everlasting wedding feast of the Lamb where you will partake of this meal with us in the eternal consummate kingdom of God. Set our hearts and our minds upon Christ as we partake of him by faith, we ask in his name. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples as I, ministering in his name, give this bread to you. Let's wait till all have been served so we can partake as one. The Lord Jesus said, take eat. This is my body. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. In the same manner, our Savior also took the cup, and having given thanks, as has been done in his name, 
He gave it to his disciples as I'm ministering in his name. Give this cup to you. I believe the outermost ring is wine. Perfect. And everything in the middle is, is grape juice. Our Lord Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remission of sins. Drink of it, all of you. Let's partake together. Let's pray. Our holy God, we thank you that in the Lord Jesus Christ, by his blood shed, by his body broken, by his resurrection, by his ascension into glory, we have access to you that we can call you Father, that we can call Jesus our elder brother and Lord, and that we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in our midst. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us by this meal, spiritually make us whole, cause us to move forward in new obedience because of your work in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As the elders and those serving uh, go back to their seats, I invite you to stand and uh, sing hymn 310, Rejoice the Lord is King, and stand and sing hymn 310. <laughs> Choice the Lord is King. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and try on He had purged our saints, he took and seen His kingdom cannot
Please be seated. go before the Lord again in a time of prayer. Let's pray together. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you that we can call upon your name. We thank you that you care to hear uh, the, the concerns and cares that, that we have as your people, that you welcome us as your children to call out to you for grace and for help in our time of need. Thank you that the Spirit is at work within the midst of your church. When we are too weak to pray in our own strength, the Spirit helps the weak. We praise you for that, Lord, and we come to you now to bring our, our request to you. We pray, Lord, that you would be with your church around the world. We pray for those uh, brothers and sisters around the world who are persecuted for the sake of Christ, we ask, Lord, you'd continue to give them boldness and perseverance under such suffering. We pray that it might have its refining <clears throat> uh, end goal in their, in their churches. But Lord, we pray for your common grace to restrain the wickedness within this world that seeks to snuff out the church. We pray that we would hold fast to your promise that you will build the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. We ask, Lord, that you'd be with our missionaries around the world. We pray especially for our missionaries in Ukraine. We ask, Lord, that you would sustain them as they care for uh, refugees that are, that are fleeing from the front lines of, of this war. We pray, Lord, that there would be a quick a resolution, uh, that peace would be established, that your church, even in this dark time, would shine forth the light of the gospel and Seek to bring the, the message of, of peace in the Lord Jesus Christ to those who are consumed with anger, who are uh, under uh, great suffering. Father, we pray for your local church here in Easton. Father, establish these dear saints in your love and in your grace and in the truth of your word. Uh, bless the session. Uh, bless uh, Pastor Tipton and, and the elders and the deacons as they serve. Bless the members here and bless those who are visiting with them. We, we pray, Lord, that your word as it's faithfully proclaimed week by week would not return void, but accomplish that for which you send it. We pray, Lord, for um, a great harvest of souls in the eastern area and surrounding areas as the gospel is proclaimed, as, as we as the church go out and are salt and light in our various callings. We pray, Lord, that you would call people to yourself, that the sovereign spirit would do his work. We pray, Lord, that you would be with the Presbytery of Philadelphia. We ask, Lord, that their meeting uh, yesterday would go on to uh, produce great fruit and, and life and benefit for the churches within this presbytery. We also pray, Father, for the specific requests of, of your people here. We pray, Lord, for those who are sick and need healing. You would bring healing to them. We pray for uh, Al's uh, upcoming surgery, Father, that all things would go well, that you'd give skill uh, to the surgeon and those caring for him. You'd quiet his soul if it is anxious, and we pray that uh, you would be glorified throughout all of this. We also pray, Father, for those who have been hospitalized, for those who are in pain, for those who, who need help, that they would know of your uh, 
of your abiding presence with them by your spirit, that they would receive the help and care that they need, and that they would look to the Lord Jesus Christ as risen and glorified, the one who will um, give us glorified bodies uh, when he returns. May our hope be fully set upon him. We pray, Father, for uh, the individuals and families of this congregation. We pray for the covenant children here, asking, Lord, that uh, you would work in their lives, that uh, they would never know a day when they did not call upon you as their Lord and Savior, and that you would provide for the next generation of the church and even raise up elders and deacons and pastors from the covenant children here and, and faithful members of your church that, that serve throughout their lives for the sake of Christ. Father, we pray for all the needs upon uh, the prayer list. Lord, you know them better than I do, and we pray that you would care for each and every one who is in need. We pray for those of us who have loved ones, whether it be family or neighbors uh, or friends that do not know Christ. May you work in their hearts. May you use us as your instruments to bring the gospel uh, to them. May our, our love for them um, also be a, a picture of, of Christ's love uh, for the lost. And we pray, Father, that you would equip us in every way to be those who are rooted and grounded and established in your word, those who trust in Jesus Christ and those who obey him uh, for the glory of your name. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, please stand now as God himself dismisses you with his blessing from his word in 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.